one to the two, two to the three, and the place to be. <laughs> if you have uh, been following me for years and years, I used to kick off every show like that. So I had some fans telling me I was trying to sound like a white rapper, which was not the case at all. It was just the intro to the fucking podcast. So <laughs> I don't think I've ever got on here like, yo, yo, what's up? Well, yeah, yo, this is TNA, baby. You know what I'm saying? So whatever. This is your TNA emergence review for 2024. You are not seeing my pretty face today, which might be a good thing for some of you. I'm still not feeling wonderful. Uh, I feel, I, I mean, I, I should say I feel okay. I just still have a cough. And uh, to record like this makes it a little easier for me to punch in and out if necessary. So I can take some time to to cough it out or whatever. But um, I don't know. That last one I re recorded for you guys, it was like I recorded two episodes in a row where I was like really tired. And then the last one I did, I just felt like a fucking dog. Um, well, I was sick as a dog. Uh, so, you know, hopefully uh, I get through this review a little bit easier. We can kind of get back to normal here uh, sooner than later. So we're going to talk TNA Emergence. I did not watch the episode of Impact. I, I explained this many, many times. I usually don't uh, prior to... Uh, whether it's a TNA Plus show on the weekend or uh, pay-per-view. Go-home shows aren't my favorite to begin with. I heard that this one was pretty good. The card looked pretty good. And I'm not trying to sound holier than thou as a wrestling fan by any means. It's it's a lot for me to watch you know, five hours of wrestling in a couple days. The majority of you can do that, not a problem. Um, a lot of podcasters can do that, not a problem. It's a lot for me. I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. So I usually just kind of to skip out and, uh, you know, get into the big show. Um, I watch this show for the most part on mute. I just I just decided I wanted a, a Tom Hannafin, uh, Matt Raywall break. So I just threw it on on mute. I, that's pretty much how I watch this whole thing. Um, I know I'm the worst podcaster on the planet. Uh, I've already uh, conceded the number one place to be to uh, to Mike Gilbert. I was saying last week on the podcast, and I'm I'm going to continue to to put him over um, as the weeks go. But uh, for me as a podcaster, me as a YouTuber, I am to the point where I'm just kind of watching the show. And I've said this like many times: I don't read the dirt sheets. I don't click on a single wrestling website. Um, uh, I shouldn't say that if I'm on Facebook and there's, there's an article that kind of intrigues me or whatever, I'll click on it. But, um, uh, I've always been that kind of wrestling fan. I just kind of like watch the show week to week. I don't pay too much attention on what goes on behind the scenes, uh, to an, to an extent I have that responsibility as a podcaster. That's why I, you know, I, I try to get some inside info information for you guys, but that's just never been the type of wrestling fan I am. I, I usually kind of just watch the show when it comes on, watch the pay-per-view when it comes on, and I go off that information. But if you're someone who, like Mike, you know, subscribes to Meltzer and Sean Sapp and, and these dudes, and he's pulling up um, uh, seating charts and talking about TV markets and, uh, you know, puts a lot of a lot of effort into the way he covers the show in very, very uh very small detail very in depth his his thoughts of the show thought of the program very similar to mine you know people are going to say he's negative like i am we have very very similar views we're very similar individuals but he does go in, into depth in a way that many of you probably want me to and i just don't and don't care to so you know definitely look up mike and jd show youtube channel and then, uh, you know, get with the Patreon. I'm a Patreon subscriber there, and he does a very good job just touching on the TNA news in, in a way that, again, I just don't and won't. So with that being said, I did listen to his review to the episode, so I, I, I know what happened. Uh, I know what went down. And I might go back and watch 
a couple matches here or there, but um, I did watch Emergence. And again, I'm the word po- worst podcaster on the planet because I barely listen to anything the uh, announcers were saying. Uh, I had the I had the volume at like an eight, so I could like kind of hear something, but all I could hear was Matt was uh, Tom Hadfin saying Rawr! That's the only thing I could hear at that volume. And then I uh, I turned it up at one point for a few seconds. I was like, you know what? Let's just let's just listen to the show. Whatever. I swear to God, the very first thing out of his mouth. Oh, and I can't count. So I said, okay, I'm I'm already owing a kicked out out. So we'll just continue to watch this thing on mute. I did not catch the pre-show. Again, I am the worst podcaster on the planet. Uh, this is not the number one place to be. It's like the number 59th place to be now. Um, I did not watch Kushida versus Frankie Kazarian. Uh, I'm sure it was a fine little wrestling match. They're they're trying to find ways. Kazarian, they will get him little wins, but he loses when it matters. He loses when it counts. And I actually thought he was going to get involved in the main event because he has been wanting a world title shot and it kind of makes no sense because you've got this fighting champion who will fight anybody uh he was frankie kazarian was the last two at slammiversary and you know i i felt that when telegraph and tom said on commentary the other day doesn't frankie kazarian know you gotta earn a title shot around here I felt he was kind of telegraphing that Kazarian was going to get involved in this main event. I'm not one of the people that think Nick Nemeth is going to have a particularly long run. I think it's going to be very short. I think they promised him a title run. I think he's going to have a couple fun little matches, and then I think he's going to drop it, and they're going to get back to where they need to be, which is Moose being the champion and Joe Hendry beating him. So that's what I think. Or, or, uh, or Santana beating him. But I think that is the direction they're going. I think the Nick Nemeth thing was number one promise. Number two, uh, one of those things where they're like, hey, let's put the title on a WWE guy, try to get some buzz, and then go back to business as usual. So, so <sighs> creatively, things are not making a lot of sense right now when you're when you're talking about the Moose and Santana dynamic where you know the world title has to be in the mix there in one way or another. Um, Frankie Gazarian trying to be a champion. Joe Hendry, who should be in the main event scene and isn't. I shouldn't say he's not in the main event scene. He's in main events, but he's he's tagging up. That doesn't make a lot of sense, because if you watch the NXT program, it looks like they're very focused, and they know what they want to do with Joe Hendry. You don't get that vibe watching TNA. It looks like they're just trying to throw them in places. And then you've got Josh Alexander in the mix. who had this great heel turn. Dude is like dead in the water all of a sudden because he can't win. And wrestling history tells us a match like Slammiversary that you get this heel turn that no one was expecting. That person's probably going to win the match or be responsible for whoever wins the match. What happened? That's why I've been saying I think they promised Nick Nemeth the win a long time ago, and they couldn't pivot. And then the weird thing is, Joe Hendry, who's the person that Josh Alexander turned on, nutshot at him, called him a joke, accused him of taking his spot when Josh has been here being the guy. There's nothing, nothing going on. You have actual heat built in there in this wrestling industry where we just lack heat and that we we lack heat in tna right now there's built-in heat to this feud and i think that they just decided to stay course they just said you know several months ago they weren't expecting joe hendry to blow up like this they weren't expecting to have to turn josh alexander heel so okay we're gonna make some little adjustments here in the mid card, but we're, we already wrote creative for the rest of the year. So uh, that's just not going to happen. And <laughs> just like on this past episode where they're kind of teasing um, the Jake something heel turn, 
when it, it could have very organically happened versus Joe Hendry uh, a couple months ago. And because it was starting to happen organically and it wasn't what they wrote in the script, they're like, let's keep Jake off TV for a while and then revisit the fucking feud later or revisit the angle later. So right now, creative for, creatively for me, a lot is not making sense. Could that be by design? Yeah, it's, it's possible. And that could just mean Bound for Glory is going to be another multi-person match. That might be, you know, when it's so jumbled at the top and you're like, it just seems like everyone is kind of involved with each other, but they're kind of not at the same time. I just wouldn't be shocked if Bound for Glory rolls around and we're not getting Moose versus Santana versus Kazarian, or almost the same fucking main event for Slammiversary. Minus maybe Nick Nemeth or something if he's not champion. So um, there's just weird things going on right now. I'm creatively not really fulfilled watching this show. But I am trying to exercise some patience. But there's just um, it just a lot doesn't make sense. And I, and I like I like I don't want to know what they're doing ahead of time. That's not what I'm saying. But I want what I'm watching to be sensical and. I'm not seeing that right now when I'm watching this show. So again, Frankie Gazarian uh, defeats Kushida. I'm sure it was a fine little wrestling match. They needed to get Frankie Gazarian a win back uh, because he lost the Ultimate X thing and he's lost this guy and that guy. So they, you know, they do what they got to do to try to to keep him in the mix. Um, based off the clips I saw here and what people. Saw said online is that the return of the piss yellow filter was there for the um, the pre show, and when it went to the main show, it, it appeared they got rid of it. Uh, I saw maybe like a ten percent tint, you know, very very small. You can only notice from some angles, but what I've seen of the pre show, it looks like they did use it. Um, someone thinks it looks good there, and what I was told was that some of the people that Scott hired to produce the show are still there. And I think they're going to move on for the, from those individuals. And I think they slowly are because we're seeing an episode week to week that's starting to look very good. And then every once in a while they go back to, hey, let's mess with the color levels. That Those are Scott's guys. Okay? Those are the ones who think this looks good. The company knows it doesn't look good. I've been assured that what they are doing editing the show that they are aware it doesn't look good. But uh, what I think happened is, is Scott's guys probably did the pre-show because uh, they're probably going to phase those guys out. Scott's guys, I think, did the pre-show and then the individuals they want to be there long-term did the rest of the show. So that is that is my assumption on all this. Gia Miller review, uh, excuse me, interviewed AJ Francis and they revealed Casey Navarro will take Rich Swan's place. I think this was a, a band-aid. I don't expect to see Casey Navarro part of first class going forward. I think this was a, even though they did a pretty good job matching their ring gear, I felt like it was a band-aid. I told you guys there was a potential new m- member of first class coming. That's who I thought they were going to use here. And they didn't. And I don't think they're going to. I think it was a plan, but I don't think it's something they're going to see through, unfortunately. I would have had more interest in that result, and um, maybe I'll, I can get into who that is in the future if um, if the person's no longer in the company or something like that. But yeah, um, Casey Navarro, random as fuck. It's like, hey, you're here. <laughs> you're in this tag team now. I like him. I like Casey Navarro. This this didn't work for me though. Um. So yeah, uh, let me scroll down here. So the next match we get on the pre-show, Matt Cardona's monster, his surprise monster, Shira, taking on your favorite, my favorite, PCO. Smells like Bigfoot's dick. Um. No one does the surprise entrant, participant, 
partner worse than TNA. Just historically, it's it's been a bomb. Um, I would say twenty percent of the time it's something good, but it's it's usually a bomb. So we've had three mystery Cardona partners so far. It's been Khan, Shira, and Madman Fulton, who will probably the latter will probably never see again. And TNA fans like him is is the frustrating thing. They want to see him on screen, um, but I but the way he took the L and took the Brooksy bomb, I don't think we're ever going to see him again. Or, I mean, Big Con. You and at first I was like, well, if he if he's got a little stable going here with Fulton and Con, I can buy into it. Uh, I don't think that's where they're going. They're just Cardona is just randomly trying to find monsters. And PCO, who smells like Bigfoot's dick, is just beating him. They they won the the six man tag last week. He wins here, like feud over, feud over. Where's the heat? Why? I understand Cardona's like ducking him, but all he did was attack him on his honeymoon. Well, I guess on at his wedding day as well. So PCO wants to get his revenge, but. Like PCO's gotten the upper hand ever since. I get he got get wants to get his hands on Matt Cardona, but I mean, I don't I don't know. Like I've really lost interest in this very quickly. It probably makes more sense for PCO to get these wins. I, I'm not saying PCO should just take a bunch of L's, but it it just seems like there's just no heat. We we've the heat is gone. Is 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 really what I'm getting at. I don't think PCO needed to wrestle all these guys. I think Cardona should have kept fucking with him until PCO got his hands on him. You you understand what I'm saying? Like we're just we lack heat. This this has nothing. You know, one story I didn't tell you guys. I'm gonna say this very very quickly. Speaking of honeymoons, when I was uh when I came back from my honeymoon and I was telling you guys a little bit about it, there was one detail that I completely left out. Was you know what I did? Did I tell you guys? I think I did. I said, uh, anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to say it again, just in case my wife is very good about checking in for flights 24 hours in advance. I'm not, I just show up at the airport. So, uh, she tried to check in. We were unable to check in, call the airline and we had been bumped off the flight cause it got overbooked. And I was like, yo, we're, we're going on our honeymoon here. Like we need, we need a flight to fucking Houston. And they end up saying we got a flight leaving in two hours. <laughs> and fortunately we live 15 minutes from the airport and uh, we made it happen. We, we got our shit together and we made it happen. My wife forgot a bunch of stuff. I, I have this, uh, I learned in the military slow is smooth and smooth is fast. So my wife is yelling at me. She's like, why aren't you hurrying? And I said, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. That, that doesn't make any sense. So <laughs> she's running around the house packing. I'm moving slow, knowing that slow is smooth, smooth is fast. We pack everything. We get to Houston. We stay the night there, open our suitcases. My wife realizes she left half her clothes. And I brought everything. Because slow is smooth and smooth is fast, folks. Anyway, maybe I did tell that story a month or so ago. I don't know. I just know I had a better honeymoon than PCO did. PCO had like the worst wedding and honeymoon I've ever seen in my life. This is this feud is just now. It just now becomes something goofy. I'm I'm so I'm so disinterested in it. Obviously, PCO won here. Versus uh, Shira. I'm so disinterested because I know that this is just going Monster's Ball. Or something along those lines. And you guys already know I don't give a shit about those matches. So, you know, that's that's where they're going with it. The only thing I would have interest in is if Cardona wins those titles from him. Which, who knows. Then we kick off uh, the main show. We got Zach. This is Ultimate X. Zachary Wentz versus Hammerstone versus Jason Hotch versus Riley Osborne of NXT 
versus the number one contender to the digital media championship, Laredo Kid, versus Cheeseball Mike Bailey. Cheese. Yeah. Didn't we lock you in the dumpster one time? I got out. So I was a little critical when they were building this because I said, what? I've been pointing out everyone's a fighting champion. That's what they're doing in TNA right now, which is really the most boring way to to book a champion. Uh, I, I'm one of those people that I think once you have a title, you should wrestle very little, and they should build up the opponent. And that's kind of it's old school mentality. You know, they didn't build up Mr. Perfect versus the Big Boss Man by having Mr. Perfect wrestle a bunch of people, and maybe he's a heel, so perhaps that's a bad a bad example. Um, but someone like the Ultimate Warrior is the Intercontinental Champion. He didn't just he didn't just start defending the title left and right because it can get he's probably not the best example either but it can get very bland with a baby face champion and having him on tv too much and having him talk too much for me the formula that kind of works is building up the opponent you just build that person up they're not taking losses uh, they just look really really strong going into the match and then the baby face wins and overcomes and now you got to build up their next challenger. Because it's very easy to overexpose a baby face. So that's kind of what I thought was going on here. I said they're doing the fighting champion. This idiot, I thought, had a, you know decided he wanted to wrestle and qualify in his own match. And then he goes and tells Rich Swan, you lost, but I'll still wrestle you. All this... <laughs> This was all done so that Cheeseball Mike Bailey could drop the title and they can get the belt on NXT. But in the process, they didn't want him to look weak and look like they were hot shotting the title. So they had him defended a couple times, essentially. So he, <laughs> so he brought this belt to one or two days of tapings and he is he has lost it. I know Mike thinks that Bailey is out of here pretty soon that this contract is coming up. I really don't know. I will I will trust him on that because again he he's digging into, you know, this person's contract is expiring and this and that, which I don't. Obviously they had to get the belt off Mustafa Ali. Mike Bailey was a good person to do it. But that's what they did here. Hey, go out there, wrestle, defend the title a couple times cuz you're going to drop it again. And Ultimate X here was very good. For me, what made this a good match was the inclusion of Hammerstone. The way he used his power in the, throughout the match gave it a different element. I've said before, I'm not a big fan of this. No weight limits. It's no limits or whatever the hell they say. Because to me, this is a cruiserweight division. And I, I think it's silly to paint it as anything other than that. It is an excuse for not having a legit mid-card title. So they're like, okay, we got this fat guy or this muscle-bound guy. We're going to throw him in there, give him the tagline, and now he's fighting for something. One thing I want to say about Hammerstone here, he does not feel like the big deal that he should. He is very much hanging out in the mid-card. He really should be in that main event scene. And he's not for whatever reason. He took that loss to slant to Eric Young. So Eric Young could do the rah-rah speech for the pay-per-view. And then he got the win back. But who the fuck cares at that point? 50-50 booking. You know what I'm saying? Hammerstone deserves more than what they're doing with him right now. Back when he had the second match versus Josh Alexander, I had said, establish this dude now. You want him to be a world champion one day? Establish him now. Don't heat him up when he needs to wear the needs the needs the belt. Or they want to give him the belt. Don't wait till then to heat him up. Like start now with this guy. Now we don't have to flip flop people in and out of the main event scene, but that's not what they're doing. So he did add something very nice to this. I'm just getting kind of tired of seeing him win, seeing him lose, seeing him win, seeing him lose. There's no hot streak whatsoever with Hammerstone. 
So Zachary Wentz wins this thing so that they can put the bell on NXT. I feel like I should have saw this coming. <laughs> I feel like a lot of us should have saw this coming. I think nine out of nine people expected Mike Bailey to retain here. And uh, that was not what happened. So um, Zach Wentz, part of a tag team, is your new X Division champion. And again, we should we should have seen this coming from a mile away. Gia Miller interviewed Josh Alexander. Again, I had this on mute. It's Gia asking some calling someone by their name. I'm here with Josh Alexander. Josh, what? It's the same format. She looks at him with the dough in the headlights look. He was probably saying he's the best professional wrestler on the planet. And I know she interviewed Nick Nemeth a little later. He was probably saying he's the best wrestler. Guys, can you imagine if Stone Cold and The Rock got on there? That's the difference between just wrestling back then and wrestling now. But, I mean, can you imagine Stone Cold and The Rock cut promos on each other about who the best professional wrestler is? There's a reason Vince kept that term off TV, why it was superstars. And and I think I'm learning more and more. I, th- I think I've learned more and more in the last year why he didn't allow certain terms to be used on television. It's it's starting to make more sense to me now. Because, like, yeah, we're watching professional wrestling, but people don't really necessarily... <sighs> Yes, a lot of people do, but a lot of people also, when wrestling was hot, didn't watch wrestling for the wrestling. It's like watching Cobra Kai for the karate. You kind of watch for the drama and the stories, and the, you know that's what I that's what I care about. To me, the wrestling is kind of secondary. I care a lot about the results, who goes over, who loses. I care about that. I'm not saying I don't enjoy wrestling. But when it, it it just becomes, I'm gonna out wrestle you, and I'm gonna use these holds, and I'm gonna do this and this. Like you, you're you're starting to cater to a very small audience talking like that. You know, what I mean, you, you completely eliminate the casuals from watching your show when you're just like, I'm a better wrestler than you. Like the casuals don't give a shit about that. You lose the aspect of entertainment. It's no longer entertainment. It's a sport, and it has to be a combination of the two to thrive. So that's why it was sports entertainment, and a lot of people didn't like that. But guess what? If it wasn't sports entertainment, it was just pro wrestling, we wouldn't be talking right now. There'd be no pro wrestling to speak of. They'd be in the bingo hall straight. Like when you're watching MLW and NWA and those presentations and from a small audience, like that would be what pro wrestling is today. Like there just has to be there just has to be more entertainment involved, folks. And these going back and forth, like I'm going to out wrestle you. You know what I'm saying? Let's move on to the next match here. We had uh Eric Young. I think those like those times are like the rah rah speeches and like getting everybody up. Cause like nobody really get motivated off that stuff anyway. But. versus Steve Macklin. What the hell? So they had nothing to do. They had nothing for these guys. So they said, we're going to have you wrestle each other. And Steve Macklin won here. I was very worried that Eric Young was going to win. I didn't know if they needed a raw, raw speech going into the next set of tapings or not. So I was a little worried um, that Eric Young was going to win here. Steve Macklin wins and they're just, they've been playing this. They've been doing this song. Steve Macklin is going to be a baby face. Kind of goes back to being a heel. And it's this back and forth. And maybe it's on purpose. I don't know. It's very possible that that's just on purpose. That's their, He's a tweener. And that's where they're trying to go with it based on the feud. I, I, don't, I don't really know. But thank God Steve Macklin wins here with, uh, with a jackknife that my mother could have kicked out of. This, uh, being total fucking, totally fucking honest. But... Um, yeah, wins out of nowhere, so it's not a decisive victory by any means, but 
it was a good match. It was two people who can work, and that's that's a that's a match that I can get with that I can get behind. But at least um, Steve Macklin's getting a little bit of momentum. Eric Young doesn't need to be beating anybody on this fucking program. The win doesn't really mean a whole lot because Eric Young just lost the other day. So you know, and it's a, again, it's not a decisive win, but it's just it's just a it's just something in the in the storyline. Like Macklin gets a win. He's going to start building a little momentum. Hopefully it doesn't, the victory doesn't mean a whole lot, but I think it, it might be the start of uh, them trying to go the baby face route with them. I don't know why they would. I don't think anyone's necessarily asking for it. So we'll see. Um, I mean, Eric Young kicked out of moves here. I think he kicked out of the, he kicked out of one of his finishes and it's just like, he kicking out a kick out of everything in the world, but then um, win with a jackknife. Then on Twitter, they've got Steve Macklin saying he's, you know, Eric Young has earned his respect. This fucking respect shit. A lot, a lot of companies are doing this. There's feuds and are like, I respect you. I respect you. Again, can you imagine The Rock and Stone Cold telling people that they respected their opponent? Or that they're telling them they respected each other. What what is this fucking respect shit that is going on in pro wrestling and handshakes and hugs? Remember when uh, Trinity was champion and and everything was handshakes and hugs and high fives every single match, and I was like, "Yo, Jordan Grace gonna turn on her." That's the logical story here. There's zero heat in this entire Trinity run, and she loses to Jordan Grace, and it's still hugs. And handshakes and high fives. And hi. Respect. I respect you. <laughs> if you respect each other, why are you fighting? Oh, because you want to decide who the best professional wrestler in the world is. That's right. Six knockouts tag. So one thing I liked about this emergence card is they did not force Jordan to defend the title. And they didn't force Spitfire to defend the title. Titles. That being said, it wasn't because they're listening to BQ's advice, who's been saying for years now, stop defending the titles at every single show. They're doing it because they had a six minute, 60 minute Iron Man match, and they had to squeeze everyone into the card. That being said, like I wish we got more of this. Knockouts champion against the tag team champions, and I mean, I had interest in this. Alicia got knocked out like a light seconds into this match i mean she was out uh they did a very good job of protecting her once they realized she was not getting up uh tommy dreamer played the bq role and ran out and saved her and picked her up and got her out of there so for what this was and what it was was a two on three handicap match i thought it was good i thought they um i thought they did a good job and you're noticing Ash by Elegance, like she came down to the ring and she's serious. It's not a fucking joke anymore. And that's what I've been asking for. And I've been telling you guys, they're going to tighten up that character. Now that Artie Evans isn't around, making it comedy and making it about the personal concierge, they're going to make some changes to Ash by Elegance. And they're, they're little by little doing that. Where she's, you know, she can still portray that character, but it doesn't have to be bad comedy. You know, she came down and she was ready for a fight. She came down, she did the gimmick, but once she hit the ring, she was ready for a fight. And that's what I appreciated out of this. I did not expect her to take the pin from Jobby Threat. Uh, they're probably going to find a way to justify that Spitfire is going to get knockouts tag team title shots because of this. Because you know the, the finish was rewritten. I'm sure Alicia was supposed to take the loss, um, but instead they had Ash do it. But you know, you know they're going to turn this into, oh, well, Spitfire won, so they're going to wrestle for the titles because they have no tag teams, so they're just going to wrestle until Spitfire wins. Like It doesn't matter how much the militia beats them. They're going to wrestle until Spitfire wins. And Spitfire is one of the worst tag teams I think they've had in this division since they've had belts. And they're determined to, keep, to have the titles on them. 
to make them two time champions. They are they are determined for this to happen. But who else who else are you gonna put the belts on? You bring in people like the Hex who you just bring them in to beat them and then you let them go. Like there are women out there that you can the crazy thing is you can sign two women and say, hey, we're gonna pay you both a couple hundred bucks a, a taping. I don't know. It just we're gonna pay you. Come be a team, come wrestle. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't know why I saying like that. I hate when people do that. Then we got the tag team title match, the ABC versus first class. Um, I have a feeling if Rich Swan was wrestling here, that first class would have won. Uh, they should have won. I would have put the titles on them, but I don't know. Um, they definitely weren't going to put the titles on AJ Francis and AJ and uh, Casey Navarro. Frankly, they shouldn't even have had the fucking match. Rich Swan wasn't available. Rather than just say, hey, we're just going to throw someone in here and pretend they are a part of this tag team, it should have just not had the match. I'm sure they could have figured something else out to do. AJ Francis could have wrestled them one of them one on one. They could have done something. The match was fine for what it was. Casey Navarro is very good in the ring. He's never beat anybody. We've never seen him win in any way, shape, or form. But ABC wins. I don't know what direction they're going to go with first class i don't know i don't know what the what the suspension means for rich swan because this is a company that only works a couple days a week so is he suspended for the month we're gonna see him again in september or is he you know i I don't really know i don't know where they're going but i i think the i don't think i know the rich swan thing really threw a wrench in things because I really think they are thinking about putting the titles on first class, and I think they should. I don't think AJ Francis should have lost the PCO, but Slam Reverse was all about feel good moments and pop the crowd. And there was no heat out of Slam Reverse except for Josh Alexander, but that's gone. And the baby face is just reigning supreme all over this company Nick Nemeth and Zach Wentz and. Jordan Grace and ABC and it's all about the baby faces in this show right now. So it's for me, it's boring. And then we move on to the main event. Not the main event. This was the main event for me. <laughs> this was the main event for me. But um, I thought that. So this is Joe Hendry with the Hardys taking on the system. I thought the entrance they did for. The Hardys was good. The Hardys don't give a shit at this point in their career. So they'll do the goofy shit. You know, Santana wasn't going to do it. Thank God. He came down because uh, he's his own man, his own brand, and he has to stay on on point and stay on par with that brand. The Hardys don't give a shit. They're just, it's the farewell tour. Um, they're trying to get back to WWE. So it's fine. But I thought it was pretty funny. Um, Jeff and Matt look like they're having a good time. And you know, believe you me, they did this for social media. They know that that entrance with the numbers the Hardys get, the numbers Joe Hendry's getting, like they knew. Hey, let's do something. Let's do an entrance for social media. the The views are probably out of the out of this world on that entrance. When I was watching the match, because I was watching on my phone, I was like, "Oh man, Eddie Edwards looking good." And then I realized I was just looking at JDC and that Eddie Edwards is still fat and wears a t-shirt so well they all wore t-shirts except for jdc so i don't really know why they were doing that they haven't really said if jdc is part of the system yet and that bothers me just say he's part of the system let's move on with this but the system stuff isn't very interesting to me at the moment unfortunately when it's one of my favorite parts of the show uh, but i'm not really interested in it and you know, this kind of goes back to what I said. They're just finding stuff for Joe Hendry to do rather than having a real program for him. And God forbid they do something with Josh Alexander, which has, has some heat. But Josh Alexander's taking L's. So why would Joe Hendry benefit from beating him at this point? That's what I'm saying. Just a lot is not making sense. A lot is not logical. And I think it's because 
they promised Joe Hendry a title and they have to go with it. And I think they probably prom- promised Matt and Jeff Hardy the titles too. And that's why we're not going to get stuff like what we need, maybe like a first class run because they're going to feel the need to put belts on people from WWE and that first and foremost, what they're going to do. And then from there, we'll see what happens. The Hardys don't need the belts. They're, they're big. They're huge. They're huge stars. They're the biggest stars in this company. They don't need the belts, but this system feuding with these guys, why? Because they jump them after matches. Santana and, and Moose, they have the only heat here. That's it. Everything else is just, we're just throwing them in matches. At least the system got the win here. Boston knee party to Matt Hardy. And we'll see what that branches off into. Because that's not what I would have expected someone from the Myers Eddie team pinning someone from the Hardy's team. Because I don't think. I, they've already had that match for the titles, but now they don't have the titles. So I don't I don't know exactly what they're doing, but they're definitely just throwing Joe Hendry in the shit. So main event, I already told you guys I was not watching a 60-minute match. I didn't watch a 30-minute match. I wasn't watching a 60-minute match. There's no way in hell your boy is watching a 60-minute match. And I heard it was okay. I heard it was okay for the first... 15 minutes or so, and then was boring and people were doing chants and Iron Man matches are very difficult to do. Jordan and Dion had a great one. It was 30 minutes and that's all it needs to be because 30 minutes is already a long time for a match. This hour shit. What do you, and, and there's, and there's almost no heat involved. It's I'm the best professional wrestler. You're the best professional wrestler. There's no heat because when they had the initial match, Nick Nemeth super kicked Josh Alexander and took him out. And then they had the match and Nick Nemeth beat him. Or no, it was a draw. I'm sorry. It was a fucking draw. But there was no heat. The draw is what left to this. There's nothing. Who who cares? Josh should have won this title. He should have won here. Um, but he didn't. And it was a long... Wrestling match. Nick Nemeth wins. And the story of the night, which is a complete non-story for me, is JBL coming out, whispering something in Nick Nemeth's ear, and then leaving. I hate JBL. Uh, When he had his run as the world champion, I did like that character. I've always liked the clothesline from hell. He's doing this thing where he's traveling to indies, and he's talking... I just... He's the very first flip-flopping color commentator. First of all, he used to bother me running down everyone's accolades every time they walked down to the ring. It was like it was like um, the way Josh Matthews used to let us know that Moose was in the NFL every single time he wrestled or that Madison Rain was a five-time knockouts champion every time she wrestled or tag team champion, whatever the fuck she was. But imagine that for every... Michael, he's a two-time Intercontinental Champion, three-time U.S. I mean, every single fucking match. But he was the uh, original flip-flopper, the one that Corey Graves got game from and fucking Don Callis and and Matt Raywall were there, heel one match and a baby face the next. I, I fucking hate him. Um, and And mainly for his commentary, but, you know, even just over the stories, reading years, how a uh, reading, I'm sorry, excuse me, let me rephrase that over the years, reading stories about how he treated other wrestlers and stuff. I don't trust him. Um, he screams one of those guys that looks down on indie wrestling, looks down on TNA. I, I bet behind the scenes, he has clowned the shit out of TNA over the years. I'm, I bet my life on it. So I just, I don't trust him. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what he's doing. I'm not interested in this. I don't care. He moves no needles for me. I'm not going to tune in live to see what JBL is going to do with Nick Nemeth. I often say about AEW, 
if I wanted to watch a bunch of people from WWE, I would watch WWE. And that's one of the reasons I got away from that company. M- one of many reasons. Um, but they're just it, just people that from the WWE at the top. I don't care about JBL. I'm fine with Nick Nemeth being champion. I would there's some people I'd prefer over him, but I'm not like totally against it. And at least he's not just a fighting champion now. Now they've got something going on here. But we should have known JB, JBL was coming because he was making his rounds on the indies. And there's actually a history when we see these kind of things on the indies. Um, someone eventually showing up at TNA as well. Uh, the reason I say that is because someone is not, JBL is not flying out for one night to receive his booking fee from TNA. He might as well just stay home and watch fucking TV. So he's going to make a round out of it. He's going to make a tour out of it, collect several booking fees. Like people don't come for TNA for one booking. They're usually around. There's usually just more to it. And when he was in AAA and he was GCW, whatever, we should have known he was coming to, to TNA. I don't care. Don't fucking care. Don't like him. Don't want him on TNA television. Again, I do not trust the guy. I think in real life that he really looks down on companies that aren't the WWE. So um, I I would sit here and say, oh, let's see where it goes. I don't care. Fucking don't care. Maybe some of you guys have a different um, view. I don't think this this draws additional viewers. I don't think, I, I think a lot of fans don't like him. And again, as a TV character, he was fine. I thought his world title run was interesting. Uh, played a bit of a racist. You know, they really pushed the line. So I, I had some interest in what he did on screen. On screen, but you know what you know me with commentary. I watch this show on mute. So it's the one of the original guys I hated on commentary. I'm like, no, 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 no. Emergence was okay, folks. This wasn't their best show that they've done, but it wasn't a bad show. It was a show. They didn't need to do a 60 minute Iron Man match. The crowd didn't really want it. But, you know, at least they sold this place out. I mean, it was all of 400 people, but at least, you know, at least they sold it out. It looked pretty good on screen. And it was solid enough. There's a couple stories coming out of it. A couple nothing burgers. But that was your TNA emergence. Thanks for checking me out this week, folks. I will uh, talk to you next week. Review and impact. Peace.